and let me just introduce Kathleen McGeehan, who is busy getting her papers together, and Sam Simmons, part of the Sam Simmons Real Estate Team. Oh, see, let me back up. Actually, Kathleen is a team with her daughter Erin, and Sam is has a team with Courtney. Uh, both of these teams are dynamic and very, very busy, which is why we have asked them to, to come in and share what they do because they're both, sure they're, kicking it. they're both kicking it. So, um, Kathleen, since you're still organizing some papers, what, Sam, why don't we start with you? Mm -hmm. um, why don't you just tell folks what it is you do and share what you'd like to share? Um, so, starting with like the listing as a lead. I'm, I was just going to go over actually like a recent least listing lead I had. That's like fair <laughs> Um. Okay, so I recently sent out just sold postcards. I use um if you haven't heard of fifty freepostcards.com. It's a really cool platform that Courtney showed me actually. I don't know where she got it from, but um it has when you log in and you put your MLS ID in, it populates all of your listings that you've had and the ones that have sold. And you can literally just click on your listing and it takes you right to a pre-made postcard that looks, I should have brought one in. Um, I'll bring them in if anybody wants to see them, but it's a five by seven postcard and they pre-make it. It has your listing on there, your information already. You can edit it to, um, you know, edit things in, in the card. Um, there's like a QR code on the back. It's really official looking. Um, but this was the first time I used this website and I thought it was really easy. It was like a couple clicks and the postcard was sent out to like a certain radius around my listing. Um, so a guy called me, he got one of my postcards, he actually called me at 8 o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> I was junior, if, I don't know if any of you guys know, I have a four-year-old son, um, so I was up with him, like, getting him ready for school, and this guy was calling me, and I kind of answered the phone, like, in a huff, because I'm like, who the hell is calling me at 8 o'clock in the morning? Like, I didn't think it was going to be a listing lead, a good one at that, so I answered, and I was like, hello? <laughs> I didn't like say my name or anything, but the guy was like, oh, like, is now a good time? Like, and I'm like, I don't know, like, what do you call me for? <laughs> so um, he, he ended up, he got one of my postcards and he's been thinking about listing his house. So I said, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry, Bob. So I explained that I was, you know, kind of getting my son ready for school. I called him back and we started talking a little bit and um, I printed out this like pre-listing questionnaire um, you guys can look at it. I don't have copies or anything, but can I make copies for me? Um, you can if you wanted to. I mean, I don't know. Um, if, if, if it's fun getting headings, I think, so that way you can yeah. see what everybody does. I didn't think it had that much, but <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of brought that up on my computer. This is something that these are questions that I like to ask somebody, like my first point of contact with them, because um, I really want to find out as much about them and their story. Um, that I can so that I can connect with them so I will either depending on how the lead comes in um, I will either ask these questions over the phone in our first conversation and that's what I did with this guy or I'll send it I have like a Google Forms um, and that's what I printed out and I can send it to their email and as they answer it like I'll get the responses back in my email so sometimes that's easy too especially with everything being so virtual like during COVID, that's what I was doing with a lot of people if we couldn't catch each other like on the phone. Um, so I started with that pre-listing questionnaire um, when we were on the phone. We actually talked for like 25 or 30 minutes. Bob's my new best friend and he's like my new grandpa. I love him. Um, <laughs> so we really hit it off and we were able to connect on a few different levels. So it was cool. Um, we set up a time for me to then come to his home and kind of walk through. Um, so before that appointment, I sent him a follow-up email. I'm sure Barb's going to make copies of all this stuff for you guys. Um, I sent him a follow-up email just kind of thanking him for talking to me, talking about some of the things we talked about in our conversation. Um, and then I kind of, I sent him some comps in that email, preliminary comps. Obviously, I don't know exactly what condition his home is in, but just comps that are closest to what I knew about his home. I looked up the public records, obviously. Um, and I sent him some preliminary comps and then I, I break down it in the first um, comps that I send this person. I break it down like why I'm sending the comps and like what an appraiser kind of looks at. So I just kind of explained like some of the things that an appraiser will compare so that when this person is looking at those comps, um, they can just start to compare in their own mind. Like, you know, my kitchen's not as updated. So maybe, you know, I might accept a little bit less than this house sold for it. Um, 
So I just pinpointed some of those things. Um, and then I estimate, I always like to estimate in the first like email I send them, I like to send them as much information, useful information as possible. So I kind of estimated roughly what he might be able to sell for just knowing what I knew. And I sent him um, a breakdown of his estimated proceeds in that email. So I'm sending him um, comps, I'm sending him what the appraisers are gonna compare, um, most likely gonna compare in the comps around them. Um, I'm sending him the estimated proceeds at like the price that I think he might be able to sell for. And I like to do this because um, this can kind of open up the conversation for your first meeting about if they have any questions about your commission, like I just put 6% commission in there. I put, um, I work with transaction coordinators. So if I know this person has a good amount of equity and they can afford to pay the transaction coordinator, I'll put that fee on there. And in this first email that I sent them, I'll tell them um, this breakdown includes all the standard fees that are associated with selling, the standard 6% commission, the conveyancing fees, the transaction fees, and I'll break it down like vaguely. Um, so at our meeting, if they have any questions about those fees, they have right in front of their face. If they're good with it, they usually don't say anything and then we don't have to negotiate my commission. <laughs> um, but if they want to try to negotiate commission, that's when they'll probably bring it up and that's a whole other conversation. Um, oh, and then I also sent him in that first follow-up email the UNO requirements for his township. So he lives in Ridley Township, so the attachments include the UNO requirements. Um, and then the other thing I sent him in that first email is, so I have the pre-listing questionnaire, the UNO requirements goes within that first email, and <coughs> Seller's estimated proceeds, and then the steps to selling. I made like a flow chart. Um, so this is the steps to selling and the steps to buying because he's going to be downsizing and buying a new home. Um, so in this first email, I like to include these steps so they can review it before we meet, and then when we meet, they can give me any questions they have. We can. I don't have to walk through every single step with them, which can take. 30 to 45 minutes just explaining the entire process. They kind of like have this overview to refer to, and then they can come to me with their questions and we can talk about the steps in the process that might not make sense to them. Um, so I include that as well. Um, no. I was out of the room, I had no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no. no, I didn't talk about you. Well, I have a quick question. Where did you get your flow chart from? I just made it. Oh. Um, and we can, we'll copy this. I'll copy this stuff at the end, Bart, but you can, I'll give you a copy. Um, I just like one day sat down and started typing up each step and uh, I tried to keep each description for each step as brief as possible with just the important information. So I don't, like I like to give people a good amount of useful information but not overload them with too much because then people just lose, like, lose interest or, you know. So I made it. So Sam, uh, forgive me since I wasn't the room, I don't know everything that you did cover. What you're talking about, this is what you send people the email before you meet with them. Yeah. So this is sort of your pre-listing yeah. packet. Right. So when you do meet with them, um, is it strictly, okay, let's talk about the house price? Um, so then when I meet with them, so when I met with Bob, we were already like good old friends by the time I got to his house. Because after I sent him that um, first email, we talked again a little bit. And so when I met with him, he kind of just gave me the grand tour. He, walked me around the house. I like to do that first. Um, I walk around and take my notes about whatever like amenities or stainless steel appliances, whatever he's got going on in his house, whatever he wants to tell me he's done to the house. I take my notes and walk around. Um, I try to take notes of like if he's got like a certain sports team up or something like that so I can figure other ways to connect with them. Um, and then we sat down and talked. First we talked about price. So this guy in particular like <coughs> Excuse me. He wanted to address first that he wasn't satisfied with the price that I estimated in my preliminary estimate with my preliminary comps. So we talked about that a little bit and I let him know. Um, I send these ahead of time so that his mind can just start working. He can start seeing some numbers, seeing what's selling around him. 
Um, and then after our meeting, I sent him another set of comps, an updated set of comps that are more obviously going to have to do more with his home after the walkthrough. Um, his home is really unique because he's got like almost 3,700 square feet and he's in more in its Ridley School District and all the comps around him are like a thousand square feet less. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was kind of like tough to comp. There was like one comp that had similar square footage, but um, so we had a pretty good conversation about price and how people, how the appraisers, you know, do things and stuff like that. Um, he was kind of one of those people that thought his house was worth a lot more than it probably is worth. So I'm trying not to lose him in that struggle. Um, so I had a pretty detailed second follow-up email after our, our appointment that was really specific towards comps, what, um, what appraisers do, because that's our struggle in this particular situation. Um, so a lot of our talk at our first appointment was about price and comps and things of that nature. Um, then we, I asked him if he had any questions. We talked about, you know, the steps of selling, getting ready to sell. I asked him if he had any questions about that because, again, I don't like to talk too much. I can get carried away if I start talking too much, so I kind of like to leave it open to them. So I asked him, you know, did you see the flow chart that I sent you about the steps? Um, do you have any questions or anything you want to talk about in regards to that? Um, so we talked about that for a little bit, and then we started talking about this time frame. That's when I like to really narrow down this time frame and what our steps are going to be moving forward. So then I start to think about, all right, once I leave this house, what am I going to do for you, and what do you need to do, and when are we going to meet again? Um, so that's kind of where we left off. Do you try to get people to sign the listing contract that first on that first meeting, or, or do you do it usually do it to yourself? It depends. Um, I kind of really go with every, I kind of go situational with, and I kind of go off that person's vibes and he's not really sure what his time frame's looking like. He's not in a rush. Um, so, and I'm really focusing on trying to build a relationship and the trust between us at this point with him. So I didn't have him sign a listing contract, um, especially because he doesn't know when he wants to even list and doesn't know where he's going next. Um, so in this particular situation, um, we're going to start looking at, our next step is to start looking at his options. He wants to downsize, so <coughs> I'm going to maybe set a portal up for him so he can start to get his mind working in that direction. I feel like this is like, this situation is going to be like very step by step and it might take a few months. Um, but I'm hoping to have a listing contract signed within the next couple of weeks or the next, maybe by the next time we meet. So, or do you have an appointment set up with him again? I have to follow up with him this morning actually. I met with him on... Friday. Awesome. Again, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Sam about this particular situation? Sam, when you send um, like preliminary comps, which is obviously a good idea, do you just send like the, the not like the price and the address, or do you have like the listing included where they can see pictures of the house that they sold? Um, I will send. I send them like from from the MLS. Like I use that MLS link. So first I send them to myself, so I can just copy and paste that few listings link into an email. Right. Um, but, wait, what was the question? Like, will they see, can they see pictures of the house? Oh, yeah, yeah, they'll see it just like how you can see, like if you set somebody up on a portal, okay. they'll see it as a listing like that, <laughs> all the listing information. For Bob in particular, though, um, I had to, the email that I sent him in the contact <laughs> him, he like doesn't know how to work his email, so I printed it all out. And if I ever print out comps, um, like, so what I did for him, except this isn't his copy, I'll, I'll print out the client full and I'll highlight all of the details that I think, like, he needs to really focus in on. This is what we're comparing to your house. The price, um, what price it was originally listed at, how many days on market, like, how long it took to sell, the square footage, the bedrooms, taxes. I highlight all that on, like, the printed version. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Fair question about the... It's kind of related to that. The portal, when you send them the portal, when you have the situation like, you know, an, an older gentleman like that, it doesn't really, it's not really tech savvy. What do you do about going through the portal and the listings that you're sending them? Um, what, for his buy side portal? Yeah. So it's going to be tricky with him. I, I might have to create a new email for him. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to set the portal up. I'm going to send it to his email that he's given me. Um, he's, but he keeps telling me he's having trouble accessing it. So I'm going to go back to his house. I, I sent him a follow-up email and everything. I got uh, updated comps, but I'm printing them out today. I'm going to go drop them off at his house. Um, and at that point, I'm going to help him with his email. 
So it's more hands on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, we might have to create a new email account or something. I don't know how I'm getting around that yet. I want you to list the appointment. Don't make sure your phone's on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sam, I yes. have a question for you. Do you mm -hmm. normally have them sign the listing contract? Um, do you bring it with you when you're at the present, like at the appointment, or do you send them through the DocuSign like later on? In a normal situation, um, if this wasn't Bob, um, I would send it to them after our first appointment. I don't know if that's what you want me to be saying. I want you. I want you. Okay. To <laughs> I'm a very like I um, I sometimes will bring the documents and the contracts with me, but I kind of, like I said, I kind of get that feel on the first call and how this person might be. They might be not ready to see the contracts yet. So sometimes I'll wait to pull those out until after the, how we, you know, our first meeting goes. And then usually um, I would have sent these contracts and the listing contracts to, to Bob right after our, we met on Friday um, for him to sign. But since Bob's a different kind of situation, um, kind of hold it off. But I, yeah, I personally don't, in most situations, at least, have them sign right away. Yeah, sometimes you know, if you go on an, an initial listing presentation and you walk in their house and you realize that they have some serious cleaning up to do, decluttering, they may not know exactly where they want to go, they're still trying to figure things out, they may not be ready to actually go under contract for a little while. Feel them out. Every situation is different, you know. I mean, I usually, I'm old school. I still like to have, I still walk into a house with contracts. Yeah. Uh, but it, you get you're right. You go by the vibe. You go by what's happening. I've been on listing presentation or gone on listing appointments where I thought, oh, this is going to be a great appointment. I know they're they're calling me and we're going to sign tonight. That sign's going to be in the yard in two weeks. And I go in and they're like. Yeah, you were thinking of moving in about a year or two. I'm like, okay, not a problem. Let's have the conversation. So, you just don't... Some, sometimes I've gone into situations where I'm, I think I have the job, and I'm actually like, they're actually like interviewing me, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm going in like, oh, this is my listing, and then if I whip out a contract, they're like, wait, oh. <laughs> like, who knows? Yeah. Like, yeah. who said that? Yeah. So I kind of like have to fill it out. <laughs> and there are scripts for that, by the way. When you go in and you realize that you were in a, in a competition situation, you know that you know they already met with me. They're meeting with Sam, and tomorrow they're meeting with Kathleen, and you know, the day after that they're going to meet with Hussein. You know, there are scripts on how you handle that. So there's a script for everything. I will say that also I don't just hand them this paper. I am a little bit more um, nice for presentation. I usually use a black KW folder and I put my business card in it too. Awesome. I'm not this disorganized. Thank you. <laughs> so let's say thank you very much for, for all of that. Let's um, move on to Kathleen. Give us again your initial contact, uh, what you do for that pre listing. And then what I'd like to do. Um, is that how they have at least one of you actually demo uh, a listing presentation? So why don't you give us uh, well, that? I was going to start a little bit different. That's no, fine. Whatever works. So, um, so because everybody's new, and I don't know if anybody's had listings and sales yet, but don't get discouraged because personally, I've had nine listings so far this year and twelve buyers, and then I've had five referrals. So. I'm kind of all over the place, so don't get discouraged if you don't get a listing. They do come eventually. Um, it could be through a friend or, you know, your sign on a house on Main Street and then the person next door wants to sell. So don't get discouraged if you don't have listings. Um, every year, that's probably, like, my ratios, probably half and half with listings and with buyers. So I just want to let you know that not to get discouraged. Um, so when I go into a listing, I have a packet that I do use the Keller Williams folders. That's what my documents are in. This is what I leave people. I buy these at the dollar store. They're a buck. There's a little space for your card inside. And it has, I puncture holes in the important stuff. And then these are things that are going to fill out. So I separate everything. And, the first, and I made a copy of this whole thing for everybody. That's why I'm trying to sort it. It's going to take a while, but everybody gets about me. <laughs> so the first page is pretty much like my resume because they are interviewing us, but we're also interviewing them. I've had these things. I walk out, oh, I don't want to work with them. And, I, you know, you just, I don't know, you should refer to somebody if they're not dreadful or just don't, 
answer. I don't know. I've had that happen to me before where I didn't want a listing. So don't think every listing you go into you have to take. You don't. Because you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So, I mean, it's your business. So you want to take on what you're comfortable with. I've had, Barb knows, I've had a million stories that I've been in court. I've done everything pretty much. And um, sometimes the stress isn't worth it. Just want to clarify that one. Um, and then I have a page just telling about <coughs> what I do when I list their home, the step by step, pretty much. On here, on this page, this is everywhere your house is listed after I advertise. I mean, after I meet with you and I get your listing, that's where your house will be shown. Oops, sorry. Do I get the Absolutely. <laughs> and then I have a step by step uh, process um, explained to what I do. Like, we acquire the appointment first and then prepare comps. So when I do my comps, I use something that everyone in here pays for and a lot of you don't know about. It's called RPR. It's through uh, Bright MLS. You pay for it when you pay for your Bright. So go on it, sign up, and use it because it's awesome. You can email the comp report to your, lister, your, your listing or to your sellers, buyers, whatever you want to do. You can do both. It's like 70 pages. Don't say I'll, don't send it right over. It, it will do it in 10 minutes. Wait a few hours. Because <laughs> then it looks like you did all this work. And you're paying for this too because it's great. It pulls all from great. So all the information that they're going to ask you is going to be on those documents. I don't print it out because it's usually 70 pages. So I email that and then I can print out just the comps. You can print out just the comps and take the comps with you. What's on, what's different about the um, R, RPR? Like what's on there? What kind of Everything. It has the the taxes. It has um, like previous taxes. It has the schools, the rating of the schools, what's nearby, restaurants. It has everything. Yeah, it has everything. Okay. It has yeah. great graphs. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of graphs. If you're on dealing it. with um, you know an engineer, somebody mm -hmm. very analytical, they love it. Yeah. They love it. And some people can get overwhelmed by it. I tell them, do not print it out, it's too long. You know, and then you know you can and you know you can just get on the computer and just take your time leisurely and, and read it. Senior citizens, I don't do that because they're not going to get on the computer. I'm not going to print that out. You can print a smaller version of it. So it, on the side panel it'll ask you to select what you want in the report. So some, like you can just select just the comps and print just the comps. You can select everything, you know, that they're printing all the graphs if you want. But like I said, sometimes it's overwhelming for some people. Um, and then, so here are the comps. I also, like I said, I have a Keller Williams folder. I always bring my documents. And I agree with Sam and Barb. Sometimes you don't, they don't want to sign and you kind of get that feeling. You'll get that vibe. Um, so, and then we tour the house and make the appointment. We tour the house. And then I explain the services that go along with what I'm going to do for them. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing track here. Oh, and then I want to find out their goals, um, price range. I'm going to use an example. I have a house right now in Philly. It's my girlfriend's son. She's like, hold us into you. My price for the house was 225 We went in, he wanted 295 It's in, it's in, um, it's in Grace Ferry in South Philly. I mean, granted, I mean, you know, people that want to live down there, it's it's called the Forgotten Bottom. It's actually to the west, I think, of 76. So it's a small little pocket down there. The Schuylkill starts right there. It has a lot of really good um, amenities that are near the house, but it's still just a two-bedroom, one-and-a-half bath house. So the pool of comps from it, I got there, and he's like, hey, well, I don't know why you're yelling at me. I'm like, all right, all right. So what I do in the listing agreement, I forget what page it is, I think it's in the back. I put on there that, and I don't do it with everybody because not everybody's comfortable with it, but it makes it easier that within two weeks, if we don't get 10 showings and one offer, we're gonna lower the price by whatever percentage or amount we decide at the time. That way I don't have to call him, but I shoot him a text and say, hey John, today's the 14th day, I'm lowering the price and it will be this. So I let him know, so the first time I don't have to go back and forth and try to figure out what the price is going to be. Now, he's texting me. We're down to 245 Almost where I want to be. But, I mean, not quite there. 
no showings at all at 295, 275, 265. Now, now and realtors go in there and they go, oh, they keep lowering the price. Well, I'm honest, I'm lowering the price because it's not the price I picked. It's the price, everybody wants a million dollars for their house. Everyone thinks that their house is worth more than it is. And they, like my dad, he's another one, his house, he thought he could get like 500,000. I'm like, pick it up, put it somewhere else, you can. But you have to go by the area and what the comments are. <laughs> It is what it is, and it's it shows right there with the listing that I have right now. Um, you have to price it right for it to sell. And I tried to do the thing where the way the market is right now, if we price it a little bit lower, we'll get multiple offers, and he didn't want to hear any of that. He wanted two ninety five. Oh, yeah. Started at two ninety five, and you can't tell them no, right? That's what is they want to list it for. Is it still listed? there? Yes, it is. Is he upset about it? No, he keeps texting me and lowering the price. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he knows. I just wish he would do what I, it would have been gone by now, most likely. Mm -hmm. Because I used to work in KW Philly, so I contacted a lot of agents down there that are down there, and they're like, "That's too high." So I know, but just go and look at it. Like, just send your buyers and write us an offer. I'm aware that it's overpriced, but it doesn't matter. It's not what it's what he wanted to do. So sellers' goals. So they're always all different. They're, you know. They are what they are, and when you get like the inspection report and all that kind of stuff, that's a whole other story too. Um, and then the selling process. I go over the selling process. That's all in these in this paperwork that I'm going to give everybody. So, from the time they sign the listing document, that they're going to get copies of everything. I explain the whole DocuSign to them if they can't DocuSign. So I have my SRES, which is I work with senior citizens a lot because of my father. Um, he lives in a retirement village, and I do a lot of their sales and buy, or sales, really. And I've gotten a buy from one of their daughters as well. So I took that certification so you can kind of understand theirs is more definitely about finance, and it's about their heart. It's like that's where they raise their family. This house is worth this much, and they don't want to hear anything. So you have to learn, I guess, kind of how to talk to people that... They think their house is a mansion. They've been there 50 years and it's worth this. And so you have to explain all that. Um, pricing is the RPR report and comps. And then any service fees. So I do a, uh, the same thing <coughs> Sam does on the break, I do a, um, a profit sheet for them. At the end, I, I kind of like randomly pick eight weeks settlement and you know, I do whatever fees are in there. If I have a fee, I do have a 395 fee that I charge. I put that fee in there. It's not a broker fee. It's up at the top. There's a fee and then it says, and what percentage you're charging them. So make sure you put it up there if you're going to charge any fees. What, what do you use? So, what, what's the 395? The 395? Most of the time it's for like the um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Sue so, or Anna. Can they anything? Yeah, but that's what they pay for that anyway. That's, well, that's in there. It's I take it out of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then roles of real estate team. So my daughter does all our um, the command. So she does everything. So I always include her in every email that um, that we have. And then I review the pertinent documents thoroughly. So I go through everything and. The reason I do that is because you know you learn the hard way all the time. So in a listing appointment, I sold a house and I told them, actually it's the opposite, I'm sorry, but I'll explain it anyway. You have to leave certain things in the contract. You cannot take like uh, the TV bracket. You can't take the, um, this is the chandelier, it, like those things. Like if you want that chandelier, take it out now and replace it now. You don't want it, if you're not gonna leave the washer and dryer, it has to be documented in the agreement, it has to be put in the MLS. So I just go over all that stuff with them because it's happened so many times. Right now I'm going to court with a buyer that, I mean, it's kind of complicated, but the seller took the washer, dryer, and refrigerator. Mm -hmm. When we got there after settlement, and we did not do a walkthrough because they were 78 years old. They bought a house, but their settlement was Wednesday. We settled Monday. So he didn't even do a rent back. We did a form anyway, just to protect us. But instead of paying, the, paying him the two days, he gave him furniture. 
So we kind of switch off. It's all in writing. So Thursday, we went over to get the keys and the gentleman left. You know, we went in and he's like, oh my God, we're we'll your driver for your point. So now we're going to court because the guy's not being very uh, receptive. Um, and it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's written black and white. You know, he's been told by his agent that he needs to give them back or he needs to do some kind of um, a credit for them. And he's refusing. So we went to court one day in media and the air conditioner was broke. They sent us home. And then they rescheduled again and they sent them to, and I, I was sick, so I didn't go, but they sent them to the wrong offices. So we got rescheduled again. So it's next week. So I print everything. And for the judge, I highlight, actually, it's not even a judge. It's a panel of three people. So I highlight everything so that way they know it was in there. He signed it. He told me, oh, that was a mistake. I said, well, did you read the agreement to say, oh, it's in there. They were in there as part of it. It's in the MLS. It's in the listing contract. So just make sure you cover all that stuff. Um, I have another friend right now that she's in the, in, she has the seller. They bought a house and they had a crappy washer and dryer. Well, they wanted their washer and dryer. Well, their house was sold with a washer and dryer. I don't even know what's going to happen with this one. They switched the washers and dryers. Mm. So she told the listing of the, the uh, buying agent because she wanted to be honest. You don't want something to come back at you. You want to tell everything. You don't want to, you know, just hope that they don't notice. Well, now they're mad. And I don't even know what's going to happen with it because they're functioning washers and dryers. They're no monetary value. So I don't know what's going to happen with that one, but just make sure everything's really clear whenever you're taking a listing, what they're leaving and what they're taking. And if they want to take like the chandelier, tell them to buy a cheaper one and just switch it out now. That way it's no, you know, somebody's going to buy the house because of the chandelier. Right. They love that chandelier. Well, now you have to negotiate the chandelier. So just get rid of it before anything. Um, and then I explained DocuSign. They go through the whole DocuSign. If they can't sign, I spend a lot of time with seniors. I go over their house. I bring everything. Hours. You explain every single document. And they like that. They like, <clears> that, <throat> you know, that you're right there with them. Houses that, when they're when you have a buyer, same thing. I print everything out. You just take it to them. Because they feel so overwhelmed anyway. they got to pack their whole life up. And they're overwhelmed with what they're going to do and all the paperwork. So I spend a lot of time with people that need paper and not the computer. Um, when I'm pricing a house, I do the comparables. I look at other sellers' mistakes in pricing, like the one I made, right? You're gonna look at mine, you might even call me and say, can you tell me why it was 295 and now you're down to 255? And then it, it may have been my decision and then I have to let them know why I decided on that price, because it was wrong, but it was the seller's decision. Um, Look for the open price range. Like, so you want to, like, in, in the area, of course, it's going to be. How am I going to explain this? So you don't want to price like 263.5, right? Because you're going to fall out of the category. So, like, you price it to be or 265. Those weird numbers, it does. Like, if somebody's searching for a house and they're looking to spend up to 260, they can do 262, right? But they're only going to get from 260 down. 265 will include that 262. So I always go a little bit higher when I have buyers because it's a couple dollars a month. Um, like I said here, it says round out the numbers to attract buyers. Price online, searching by the consumer. So what the consumer does to get their price and what you do to get your price is most likely different. Um, you want to look, just be open-minded and look and see Listen to them. Uh, the house next door sold two years ago for four hundred thousand dollars. Two years ago, you have to explain that the market's changed drastically right now. How the market has changed. Um, put yourself in a buyer's shoes. I do this at every single listing appointment because people get really, really uh, what's the word? Um, Like they're not going to change your mind. I can't put the word as I'm trying to think. So you just want to let them know. Think like you're the buyer. Like when I go in and it's messy, I can't say your house is filthy, dirty. Oh my God, it's so messy. How do you handle that? So I just tell them, pretend you're the buyer and you're coming here to look at this house to buy. What would you change? 
<clears throat> Let them tell you your house is messy, dirty, and they gotta organize it. It just makes it more comfortable for everybody because that's awkward. I've been in that position before too. It's an awkward position to be in. When there are offers, when there are offers, I explain to them it's not just about the amount of money that the offer is. You gotta look at all the other aspects in the offer. Super important because right away. When you have a listing and you get an offer, they don't write that price. Oh, I'm not taking that. That's or that. Oh, I want that one. That one's really good. I had one before where the house was listed at two forty nine. We got an offer for two ninety nine. He's like, I want that. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't want that. It's cash. They have inspections though. I'm like, you don't want that offer. It's not first. And they were have they elected an appraisal. It was cash with an appraisal. Yeah. And um and inspections. And then we had one that was like 5,000 over, no inspections. Of course it has an appraisal, but it's only 5,000 over. So you gotta go through all that with them too when you do get offers. And then within 10 days, you should have 10 showings. This is what I have in here, I do 14. But right now we're doing 10, 10 showings, at least one or two offers. If not, the price is too high. And that's exactly why people don't look at your listings if the price is, if the price is too high, they're not gonna look at it. No one's going to, well, I shouldn't say that. People are over, over, over purchasing houses. But when you list a house, it's going to sit on the market like mine is right now because it's overpriced. So you just want to make sure you um, explain that to them. And then cut your price within 10 days. Because if you wait too long, seeing houses sit on the market for like two months and then they cut the price. Why? They just wasted all that time. All those buyers bought <laughs> other stuff. They knew they were eventually going to have to cut the price, cut it quick. You want to do it quick. And then during the seller's market, an increase is very possible along with multiple offers. So you got to let them know that too. I mean, if we price it where it should be, it's very possible in this market, you're going to get more anyway. So, and, and it's better to have multiple offers. And because some might not have inspections, some might not have an appraisal, um, some might be cash. So there's all different reasons. <laughs> yep. yeah, one, one comment that, uh, I've been in situations where, again, seller wants to price significantly higher than I know it should be. Uh, and a question I'll ask the seller is, well, are you interested in having me list your house or sell your house? I'm very blunt. I'm, I am very blunt here. Yep. Um, and I personally am, am not afraid to say, I understand wanting to price at the top of the market, but the price you want is so out of the market that I know we're going to end up chasing markets. What, what's happening is we we will reduce in ten days. We may have to reduce again, <laughs> unless you're willing to reduce to the point where we're basically ripping off the band aid and going from you know two ninety five to you know what two forty or something. Mm -hmm. And most sellers don't necessarily want to do that. Then I say what we're going to do is chase the market, and I think I'm going to end up disappointing you. And you know what? I would rather disappoint you today than have this on the market for two months, three months, and disappoint you then. You know, I don't think I'm the agent for you. I've said that, and that is actually, had sellers say, wait, you don't, you don't want my listing. I said, no, I do, but only if you price it right. That's me. Again, we're, we are all independent. We can, we can approach it however we want, um, but yeah, pricing it right the first time is so important. Um, and then the next page that I have in my packet is utility information that is going to help. I put it in the MLS, um, like who their gas company is, the water company, the sewer company. <coughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. I mean, I'll just go through. I'm not going to read them all. Um, and then what to do to sell the house. Any upgrades? Um, and you sent them this before you meet with them, correct? No, so I bring this. So this is your listing. Yes, right? I bring it with me. Free listing. No, okay. I bring it with me. What do you send get, send them before you meet with them? You, do you send them a pre listing packet? I don't send them a pre listing packet. Well, um, pre listing got like, like Sam has several documents she sends them after I meet with them. I don't send them. You don't send them. No, I bring the consumer notice with me. They they everyone signs that. I mean, it says real big. This is not a contract, so people weren't like crazy about not signing it. Um, so you've got two top listing agents, both with slightly different approach, but they get the job done. Um, so thank you very much. Any quick questions for Rebecca before I ask 
just want to, we'll flip a coin, see which one of them we're going to do the demo for. Um, what questions for Kathleen? It was very comprehensive, so thank you. I think, yeah, yeah. Who is a coin? Unless one really wants to do listing that. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> what do I have to do? Am I, yeah, am I there? Plus, you're an agent. One of these guys is an agent. So, and you're just gonna just you. We, we will go on the assumption that you've already sent them the pre-listing material that you do send them, mm -hmm. and you've walked through the house, and now you're gonna talk to them. Because that's where I think most people in your, the new agents get stumped. I'm saying, like, okay, I, I can send you stuff, and I can look at your house. Now what do I do? Okay. Well, this is the point where I'm kind of just like asking them asking them questions. Okay. Who wants questions. to be the seller? Bob. Bob. Ariadne. All right. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shoponi. <laughs> All right. Bob, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm gonna act like you're my Bob from my 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 actual Bob. So Bob, um, now that I have sent you some information, I sent you some preliminary comps, I sent you a roundabout what you might be able to sell for and what your proceeds are going to look like, um, and we've walked through the house, I want to start with what questions do you have? Do you have any questions about the proceeds? Do you have any questions about the comps or the process in particular? Mm. My question was about pricing on the house. Okay, yeah. So it was kind of tough to comp your house, um, especially without you know, before walking through it. It is such a unique property. Um, I really appreciate how well you've maintained it by yourself. It's be you have a beautiful home. Um, so before walking through, obviously, I could only really look at the houses in the closest proximity to you that have sold recently that are most comparable on paper. Um, square footage wise, bedrooms, bathrooms. Um, I couldn't really base it off of condition without walking through your home. Um, but really when you sell your home to a mortgage buyer, you can't get an around you can't get around an appraisal. So you're gonna have an appraiser come through and they're not gonna take anything into consideration except for the homes that have sold around you. Um, and they're gonna use those houses to, to compared to your home. So they, we have to take all emotion out of the situation and we really have to look at the facts and the comps around you. Um, now I do think that there, after walking through, you have quite a bit more square footage than most of these comps. I think that you can definitely get a little bit more than I um, suggested in my original email. Um, but I really would like to go back to my computer and look at these comps a little bit more closely now that I have some notes from your home, now that I have a good idea of the flow of your home and the condition. Um, and then maybe we can talk about a new price range and kind of narrowing it down to something that you might be more happy with and something that we could also not have too many issues with the, the actual appraisal. Okay. How do you feel about that? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your time frame. Um, I know that we are kind of exploring the option of you downsizing and purchasing a new home. Have you talked to the lender yet? No, we haven't. Okay. Um, do you have one in mind that you already have been work have worked with previously? I know you bought a home before, so. Um, okay, well, if not, I definitely have a few um, lenders that I work with very frequently and that I refer to. Um, they're knowledgeable, they'll be able to walk through the process step by step, and they're reputable and they're really well known in this area. Um, so that could also help you on the purchasing side, having a lender that has relationships with the listing agents in the area. Um, so if you don't mind, after we meet today, I can hook you up with one of those lenders. We can kind of explore that side of things, um, see where you're at financially, if you need to sell first to buy your next home, or if you can maybe buy your next home first and then we can get ready, um, get this house ready to list. Um, so that's gonna be a big piece of the puzzle. So that's gonna be one of our next steps is to figuring out the buy side so that we can kind of put together, you know, your time frame and your game plan. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, what else do we get in there? <coughs> what do you think so far, Barb? I think you're doing great. Um, can, can I pretend that I'm Bob for one second? Please do. Um, and I'm just going to throw an object objection or two at you, just because we talk a lot about 
objections, sort of common objections. Okay. So, um, so you know, Sam, I like what you're saying. I understand. I said, but can we talk about your commission? Sure. What do you want to talk about? Well, I understand. I mean, is is six percent like the you know what everybody pays? Because it seems like a lot. Six percent is is pretty much the average commission that you're going to see. Um, I don't really like to negotiate my commission. I, I feel as though I know what I bring to the table and the services that I can provide for you as a seller. Um, I know that I'm going to offer you the best service that I can. I know that I'm going to get your home sold quickly for top dollar. And if I can't negotiate my commission, then I might not be able to negotiate so well for you um, once we're in the actual process of selling your home when it comes to inspection negotiations, appraisal negotiations. Um, you know, you really want me to put my best foot forward there, don't you? Yeah, I do. So that's kind of where I stand as far as commission. Um, also, another side of it is when we list your home on the MLS, I am having to offer half of the commission that you're willing to pay to the other agent. So that's kind of an incentive sometimes for other agents. If I'm a buyer's agent and then I see that this home is offering me 3% commission, and this home is only 2% commission, even though it might not be the right way to think, I might kind of sway my buyer towards the house that's paying a little bit more. Does that make sense to you? That makes a lot of sense. But let me ask you another question. Um, how long is our contract? Because, you know, you're, I think you can do a really good job, and it sounds like you can sell things quickly. So, I mean, can we just, you know, have a contract that's only like six weeks? Um, I usually base my contract, I personally put my contract six months out um, just to cover, you know, all angles because we don't really know where we're going to list yet, first of all. Um, you know, there could be some cons to listing high if that's the way that you're leaning. Um, and if that's the case, we could sit on the market, market longer than I would expect to. Um, so there's different variables. The market is shifting. I wouldn't want to put all this effort into getting your house ready to list, listing your home, marketing your home, and then something happens where the contract ends and maybe all of my work and effort is out the window. If you decide to go with somebody else, it might not be fair to me. Okay. I don't know if that's the right thing to say. There's also just a lot of moving parts in the process, and, and one hiccup that's out of your control could really set you back a little bit. You don't want the contract yeah. to expire. Let's say, like that appraiser or inspection doesn't happen the right way, or the mortgage lender has a hiccup somewhere that's out of your control. Yeah, that's a great point. Because I had a listing earlier this year that we went on the contract, we had a few different offers. We chose what seems like the strongest offer. Um, the lender told me everything I wanted to hear. And we extended six times for this buyer. And every single time that they were just like stringing us along. And we were we were off of the market for like maybe over almost three months for this one buyer. And then we had to go back on the market. So that makes sense. In that case, there's all these things I couldn't control. And if you would have decided to go back in the market with another agent, yeah, yeah. Is, your contract, is, your, is your contract still valid if something like that happens? Yes. Yeah. If you go under contract and then something falls through, and yeah. Back and, off. and what you what you um you yeah cause you, yeah yeah okay. you're, you're still good. Um, what you would probably do it well well not probably what you would do is you would do an addendum. And change the terms. Yeah. yeah. Is there a specific on um, like a, a, a an answer you? No no. no uh, my but, th these are things that I know come up. Okay. Um, the only time. I have been on the receiving end of that question, uh, and the the, the uh, seller didn't want six weeks. I I really made an extreme just for the. That's kind of odd. I've never yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, let's do something different. Um, I had somebody ask for three months, and I negotiated to four months. Okay. And very similar. Do you usually do six? Months I don't do six months. Okay. Yeah, and I let them know that as soon as we settle, contracts not void anyway. Mm -hmm. And I also, again, this is personal, not everybody has to do this, on the last page of my, both my listing contract and my buyer agency contract, I have this contract may be terminated by either party with 24 hours written notice. Yeah. Now, if we're under contract for a property, you're not terminated, yeah. you know, let's be honest. <laughs> but if I work with a seller and I bring a ready, willing, and able buyer, and they find, you know, some stupid reason not to accept the contract. 
I would have wondered, do they really want to sell? Um, and especially if it happens twice, then we have to have a serious conversation because you are, it is your time and your money and what's going on? You know, I'm ready, willing, and able buyer. Contract says, I bring you this, you sell. Same thing with the buyer. If I show a buyer everything they say that they want to see and nothing's good enough, I have to question are they really ready to buy or they just want somebody to hang out with on a Saturday afternoon and go look at houses. So, you know, I want to have reserve the right to terminate them. As well, if, if I'm not performing, if I tell you I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and I don't for some reason, you wouldn't be able to fire me. But it, it does come up occasionally in conversation, but okay, yeah. not to that extreme. Bob uh, has the question. Um, so we're looking to move in about three months. Okay, so you think you want to buy your new home within the next three months? Or? Maybe would you be able to help us with that one? Um, yeah, so that's why I really want to set you up with a lender first because that's going to be the biggest piece of this puzzle. Um, you might have to sell first, you might be able to buy and then sell. So, depending on what order we have to do things, I think that that time frame is definitely reasonable. We just have to figure out which way to do it, like where to start. <coughs> that's more like yeah. <laughs> Any more questions, Tom? <laughs> Well, let's see, Bob. <laughs> so here's a question for Sam. When you are, you go to the house, you, again, you have this great conversation with Bob on the phone, you get a lot of uh, preliminary information, and then you go to the house, and you realize, hmm, the three cats that he has really, um, I can tell there are three cats in the house and two German Shepherds and a gerbil, you know, and maybe a ferret. Um, and obviously I'm alluding to motors in the house. So how do you tactfully let someone know? Or let's say somebody is a smoker in the house. We know that odors are very offensive to buyers. How do you handle that? That's such an awkward situation. I've only really had that experience once um, and it was like cat odor. Um, but in this situation, there was the tenants and my sellers were the landlords, so I wasn't directly offending anybody, but I did have to pretty much tell my sellers, you know, the condition, the overall condition of the house is great, like, da, 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 and I named some positive points of the house, um, but I, but then I had to throw in, you know, but, um, I did notice that, you know, that the tenant has a cat in the lower level of the home, the odor's very strong, she might not be able to notice it because she lives there, but if we have buyers that are sensitive to cats or allergic to cats, um, they may pick up on it very quickly, so I suggested, um, to do, like, stainless steamer or something. So, I don't know, I've only had that issue, I haven't had it a whole lot, so I'm not too great at it yet. Well, let me, let me <laughs> I try to always start with the positive, but... Right. Ease my way, well, into know, way to and then a solution at the end. Exactly. So just about that you start with something positive, you make the suggestion, and then you end with again something positive. Um, but then let me jump over to you for a second because you actually in your packet take your seller around. You know, okay, you know, let's you you are now the buyer. Let's let's look at the house if you were the buyer. You know, and you ask him what do you need to change. Now again, you may have to come across a seller who thinks that while well, the clutter is great and the purple wall is like the best color in the world. And of course, when you do live in a house, either with smokers or with pets or with strong cookie goaters, you do become nose blind. So um, how do you bring that nose blindness? This sheet right here. Okay. <laughs> so I have a sheet. That way, because after I talk to them about it, when I leave, I ask them to read everything. So hopefully they look, and it just makes it, because it's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. You can't say your house stinks. You know what I mean? Or, you know, you just have too many books in here. The room looks small because there's too much furniture or whatever. So this sheet, I thoroughly go over the sheet with them when we, when we sit down. So when, you know, when I say, like, what would you change as a buyer? And pull the sheet out. And then, you know, if they're saying... Say I think it really smells, then because of a pet, when you get to that page, I would probably, I don't know, it's never, it never happened to me, but I probably would say, you know, if, like you have a dog, a lot of people are allergic to animals. Um, I, I don't know. So, so I've been in this situation. 
I have been in a couple of, of pet homes. Uh, and in fact, one was actually a very dear friend of mine. And she had two huge dogs. It was not a very large house, it was a ranch house, and the house stuff. Now, yes, she was a friend, so I could speak very clearly to her. And I think they sort of, you know, we, we would roll our eyes, you know, in certain situations, um, but there's certain facial expressions we would never have with a real client, but we can have them with a, with a friend. So I would say, Bob, uh, can we talk about the dogs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could do that, I could make the face with her. Um, but if, that, if it wasn't my friend, one of the things that I have said, you know, going through is, you know, Bob, I, I do want to have a conversation about what buyers love and what turns buyers off. And I, may I be honest with you? That's the thing I ask, may I be honest? May I, may I be brutally honest? If they want to sell their house, they're going to say yes. I say, Bob, you know how much I love dogs. Well, you know how much I love cats. Yes, I am allergic to them, but I love them. When I walked in, before I got two feet into the house, I knew you had animals. That's going to be a problem with buyers. So let's talk about what we need to do. And it, yet it's not a pleasant thing to say, but you have to say it. Buyers decide within the first 15 to 20 seconds of walking into a house if they even want to go through the house. And I will tell you now, if it smells like pets, if there are sense of cooking odors, and that, that's a subjective thing because what one person loves, another person doesn't. Um, or if there's smoke, somebody's a smoker in the house. Those are the three biggest turnoffs. And it could be the best house in the world, but if, if, if they think it smells, their mind also goes to, it smells, it must be dirty, they don't take care of it, this house has a problem. I mean, it's this crazy little, you know, spinning wheel here. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be saying, what can we do? In the case of my friend, she actually sent her two dogs to live with her brother for a month wow. while she painted and redid the floors. Um, not everybody has to do that, but you have to come up with that situation. Um, any other objections you are um, are concerned about that might come up in a listing presentation since the majority of you have not been on listing presentations? Or let me ask, those of you that have had listings, has anything come up when you guys went on your listing presentations that you felt, gee, there, I wonder if there's a better way I could handle that? I went to a listing presentation and the sellers, of course, they thought their home was worth way more than what it was, but they never did any work into the house. So, and they also don't live in it currently. They lived in California. And they see these cops where, I pulled up a cop where it was like 405, where a house recently sold that's a rancher that was remodeled. But the issue was, it was a unique home where the sellers, they have more square footage. Um, they also have central air, but the newly renovated home was maybe a thousand square footage less and they didn't have central air. In this situation, like how, what would you say to where you wouldn't offend the sellers, but at the same time, they're just not reasonable in the price point, like that they wanted for their home? Um, so I just had this at a listing appointment because um, I'm showing your houses as well. So I know what she's looking for and I know the price that she wants to pay for the house. So at her listing appointment, I asked her in your house, what would you change mm -hmm. if you were buying this house? And she just kind of looked at me. I said, so I didn't want to offend her, right? But I'm like, so your kitchen, would you change your kitchen? Because she's like this white granite countertop, white cabinet. She wants like the new bright and all her kitchen's old. So I think that made her understand that the kitchen's kind of dated, like when we were pricing it. Um, I don't want to get it. it's really hard because you don't want to offend them, right? You definitely don't want to offend people, but again, you have to be honest. They they're hiring you to be honest. So, you know, what I have said <clears throat> is there three things that sell a house. You know, we used to hear location, location, location. Well, actually, it's location, price, and condition. You can't change anything about the location. The location is where it is. But the condition and the price, we have something that we can control. So again, if, if the house 
pardon me, the kitchen hasn't been updated since 1965. You know, we know that buyers are looking for something different. If it's shag carpeting from the 70s, you know, or we know what buyers want, we have to take that into consideration. Because I know you love, you raised your kids here. I walk in and, you know, this kitchen reminds me of me growing up. Yeah. And you know how old I am. I mean, this is, this is, I, this, this kitchen fills me with warm memories. But today's buyer is looking for something different. And if you don't want to make the updates, we have to price it in a way that the buyer coming in is already factoring in an additional 10, 20, 30,000, whatever it might be, to update a kitchen, a bath, a floor, etc. So I always let clients know, or, or potential sellers know, that I am speaking to them as very much as Kathleen had said through a buyer's eyes. It's, I think your house is great. I, my purple's my favorite color. And I love that purple room. You know, that 1960 kitchen, you know, yeah, I, that reminds me of my early childhood. But today's buyer wants something different. So if we want to be competitive, this is what we have to do. And I have this great, you know, you know, <laughs> like I, I'll bring you chicken soup next time. You know, it's like it's a, because we do want to validate. You know, so that's why the whole tell them something good. You know, I love this. This is great, but it's not what today's buyer is looking for. So it's well, not this easy. thing was yeah. buying, and she was looking for what she didn't have. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what she was looking for. And so will the buyers coming in her house. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I was trying to explain to her. Like exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm.